been trekking through, um, preaching through this series as we've been talking about five things every Christian needs to grow. And this is message number five. This is the last one. Thank you, sir. This is the last one we will be doing on the study of Scripture and focusing on the Word of God is just paramount. And I, I don't think it's by coincidence that Dr. Sproul makes this the primary thing, the first thing that we need to do to grow, to mature. We talked about as a precursor into this series, why do we need to grow anyway? We made the distinction that there's a difference between getting old and maturing. We know a lot of people who are old in age, um, but they're very immature people. And we know a lot of Christians that have been, uh, have been going to church for a long time, probably born and raised in the church, and they're not spiritually mature, though they've got a lot of years under their belt um, in fellowship and, and in churches. They've never spiritually matured. And we talked about why that was important. And so scripture is absolutely critical to that. So we, we started out in 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter tells us to, 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 like a newborn baby, to desire the sincere, unadulterated, uncontaminated milk of the scriptures in order that we might grow up into our salvation. Now, that's not in your King James Bible. The King James Version leaves that critical part out of the text. But Peter says that we might grow up into our salvation. We need the milk of God's word in, in order to do that. And then Jesus says uh, in Matthew chapter 4 that when he's tempted by the devil in the wilderness, um, we said Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Peter said the word of God is like milk to a newborn baby. Jesus said it's, it's soul food to a, to a hungry spirit. And then, and then we looked in Hebrews chapter 5 where the writer of Hebrews says that you guys should be on solid food, but yet you're still on milk. And he challenged us to grow up and to be able to handle the solid milk, the solid food uh, that comes in God's word. Peter said the word of God was like milk. Jesus said it was like bread. And the writer of Hebrews said that it was like that's, that it's like solid food to the mature Christian. And then um, before we started uh, pa uh, Palm Sunday and Easter week, we, we looked at um, Peter uh, Paul's message in, in 2 Timothy 3 where Peter, where Paul says to, um, that, that the word of God is breathed out, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished into all good works. So here Paul is exhorting Timothy not to blow off what God has breathed out. And so today we want to challenge ourselves with one of the most profound questions that anyone can, can endeavor to, to take on, um, and that's the question of purity. Um, the writer uh, uh, of Psalm 119 is where you should be in your Bibles ask probably one of the most profound questions. Um, and so we want to ask the question, well, is purity important? We live in a cynical uh, day and age where, where people uh, think that we make movies making fun of people that are pure. I mean, um, David, what's the guy's name? Uh, my wife is not here to help me out with this, but you guys might. Uh, the guy's name is Corral, David, David, David Corral. He made a movie about the 40-year-old virgin, right? We, Steve Carell, thank you. See, I, I don't like The Office. My wife is a, is a slave to The Office. And even now that Steve Carell is gone, she still TiVo's The Office. I don't, I don't think he's funny at all, so uh, don't hate me for that. But, but we made, he, he did a movie called The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Um, we make movies making fun of people that are 40-year-old virgins. We, I remember seeing a... Uh, a video on the web about um, this couple, and I don't know where I saw this, about this, this couple um, that were getting married, they were both virgins, and the, the, the video made light of the fact that when they had their first kiss um, at, at their wedding, it was such a nightmare, because they had never kissed anybody before. That was the first time that either of them had kissed each other. We make fun of that sort of thing. Being pure, yeah, we call people that are pure and people that are that are focused on a clean lifestyle, we call them prudes. We live in a cynical day and age where people make TV shows that 
that, that highlight and promote uh, things that are crude and that are vulgar. That's the, day, that's the day in which we live. And so when we find someone that is pure or is committed to living a lifestyle that God would, that God would be pleased with, we ridicule that person. There's a show coming out, and I'm not sure what network the show is on, but the show is called Don't Trust the Beep that's down in apartment B. Is that? Yeah. So, so um, they couldn't call the show Don't Trust the Girl down in, but they're focusing on the fact that they're calling her a bee. And then there was a show that William Shatner uh, did, Stupid, um, and then there's a lot of uh, uh, signs for curse words that my father says stupid bleep my father says they couldn't call the show stupid things my father says Asia knows all of this stuff I, she's at she's at she's she's at she's at Fox now so she's got to be up on all of this stuff right so so yeah we live in a day and an age where purity is not a priority and so does it matter why are we why are we so focused on this and and Psalm 119 is where, where I want you to look there with me. I want you to look at uh, verses 9 through 16. Psalm 119 is just a, a juggernaut. It's the largest chapter um, in all of the Bible. It's 176 verses. It's, it, it, it's comprised of 22 uh, stanzas, which, uh, which equate to the, the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. We want to look at the beta stanza, uh, which is the second one, verses 9 through 16 and what the writer uh, of this psalm is challenging us to is to purity and I want you, I want you to see a couple of things here I want you to first understand that even though we live in a cynical crude um, rude uh, society purity matters for Christians and I know that some people would would, would argue that it doesn't but I want to just make the case that it matters and then we'll look at uh, the prescription that, that, that the psalmist gives us for living pure lives. First of all, purity matters. Jesus says in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, as he gives the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Purity matters. If you expect to see God, then a clean lifestyle, purity matters. Jesus made that abundantly clear look with me at at the at the next the next passage in Psalm 24 look at what the psalmist says David says in Psalm 24 at verse verses 3 through 5 he says who may ascend into the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place the one who has clean hands and what a pure heart who has not set his mind on what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation who may enter into the holy place of God he who has clean hands and a pure heart the writer of Hebrews said it this way in Hebrews 12 and verse 14 he says to pursue peace with everyone and holiness without it no one will see the Lord now you guys know that I'm taking my first preaching class uh, at Talbot and my first sermon is going to be out of First uh, John chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 and John said it this way John says behold what manner of love is this that that the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God and we are and it does not appear what we shall be but we know that when he appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and then verse 3 is the kicker because verse 3 says anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure so John says that if you expect to see Jesus one day you should be purifying yourself even as he is pure so look out there purity doesn't matter you know we say today that we have to live together before I decide I want to marry somebody I got to take that car for a test drive before I buy it right how many times have you heard that that's not what we do. That's not what God says. But we have Christians that are, that are living together. That's not pure. What does the word of God have to say about how we should live our lives? And there's no better text um, than Psalm 119. Look 
Look there with me. I want us to see two things, that a pure lifestyle is produced by the Word of God. Look at Psalm, uh, look at verse 9. The psalmist says this. He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? Is there a more profound question than that? How do young people, and this is not specifically for young people, the psalmist gears the question toward youth, toward young people, but the question is for any man or any woman. How can a man or a woman of any age keep their life pure? And then it's easy preaching. He answers the question in the B part by keeping his life according to the word of God. So that's easy. How do, how do I live a clean, respectable, godly life? By, by, by keeping the word of God. Well, what does that look like? How do I do that? Now, because that's, that's the question, right? Well, 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 what does that look like in my life? Verses 10 through 16 bear that idea out. Verse 9 tells us what we have to do. Verses 10 through 16 tells us what that might look like in our life. And, and in verses 10 through 16, we see that, 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 that the Bible prescribes or requires certain attitudes and actions if the Word of God is going to lead us and be the medium that we need in order to purify our lives. And so, and so let's, let's look at that. The Word of God says that, and we'll see in verses 10 through 16, that there are certain actions and attitudes that, that the psalmist displayed in order for him to live the life that he's prescribing to us. So look at verse, look at verse 10 uh, with me. He says this. He says, I have sought you with all my heart. Do not let me wander from your commandments. And throughout the Psalm 119, there are all of these synonyms for, for the word of God. God. God's word is his word and his ways and his statutes, his commandments, his testimonies, his precepts. You're going to see all of these words used interchangeably. And so he says for the first action that we, have to, that we have to have, and you're going to see something special that he does in verses 10, 11, and 12. But he says the first thing we need to do if we want to live a life that honors God in our youth, the first thing we need to do is seek God. And the way we seek God is by getting ourselves involved in the Word of God. we got to get, get it into us, and we've got to get into it. The first action, number one, is that we've got to seek God in the Holy Scriptures. And then he says, don't let me wander from your commandments. There are a whole lot of pressures. There are a whole lot of things that come up in our life that, that squeeze Bible study and, and times of meditation and and spending quality time with God, reading the scriptures and just meditating. There are a whole lot of pressures that, that come upon us and make that difficult. But the psalmist says, Lord, please don't let me wander from your commandments. So the first thing we have to do is seek God. The second action in verse 11 is that he says that I've treasured your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Your Bible might say, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I think the psalmist was saying something different. I think the, I think the HCSB is, it says it a little clearer to what the psalmist was saying. It wasn't necessarily about hiding for the purpose of concealing. But, but now, one of the shows, my, I can beat up on her. My, my oldest kid is sick, so they're not here tonight. So I'm going to throw, throw my wife under the bus tonight. You guys have heard me talk about uh, how she's obsessed with the, the hoarding show. You know, uh, hoarders, and then the other show is Hoarders Buried Alive or something like that. It's just pure nonsense, right? These people that, you know, these people can't get into their front door and have dead animals and stuff in the house because they're like buried alive because they're hoarding all this trash and all of this stuff, right? That's exactly what the psalmist was talking about. He says that I've hoarded I've compiled your word in my heart in order that I might not sin against you. This is not the idea of hiding for the sake of concealing, but he says I've treasured it up. I've hoarded your word in my heart. Now, these people have all this stuff that they don't need, stuff they've never seen in years, dead, dead chickens in their, in their deep freezer, just nasty stuff. And every time I pass by the TV and my wife is watching that, I frown because this is the most ridiculous show on TV. But these people go out and buy all of this stuff, and then they're buried under it. Now, it's a sickness, it's a disease. All these people should go see Pastor Joe and get, get therapy for all of this stuff, right? Because it's a, it's a disease. 
Okay, it's a, it's a psychological disorder. I think they're nuts, but it's really something going on uh, in their psyche that's totally, uh, pa Pastor Joe would call it maladaptive behavior. Well, that's what the psalmist says that he's done with the word of God. It's that he's hoarded it in his heart. For what purpose? In order that he might not sin against the Lord. And look, folks, that's, that's an action we've got to have. We've got to treasure God's word. We've got to hoard it. We've got to, we've got to just pile it up in our hearts for the purpose of being pure. We've got to teach that to our kids. We've got to make that a priority. Now, now look, the same. I, I would say that the converse is true. If the word of God is not treasured in your heart, then you've got a, a greater capacity and a greater propensity to what? To sin. So the exact opposite is true. If treasuring up the word of God keeps us from sinning, not treasuring up the word of God puts us in a position to sin. Now, look at uh, in verse 12, we see, added, we see the first attitude. We said there are actions and attitudes that we need to have if we're going to live pure lives. The first attitude in verse 12 is, is this. He says, Lord, may you be praised. Teach me your statutes. The first attitude he displays is a teachable spirit. Lord, teach me. He's got a disposition to say, Lord, I want to I know your statutes. I want, I want you to teach me your precepts, your judgments, your word, your ways. He's teachable. Now notice something in verses 10, 11, and 12. He says that knowing God's word, knowing God's commandments, be, allowing God to teach us his precepts, his judgments, his statute, is really knowing him. Notice, notice what he says. You guys, I, I, I want to make sure that you get that. In verse 9, in verse 10, he says, I've sought you, God, with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commandments. So seeking God is equivalent to God's commandments. He says, I've treasured your word in my heart that I may not sin against who? Against you. Your word is equivalent or paramount or comparable to your, to your commandments. And then in verse 12, he says, Lord, may you be praised. Teach me your statutes. In other words, the word of God is equivalent to who God is. This tells us who God is. So we don't study the Bible just to be Bible thumpers. We study the scriptures according to verses 10, 11, and 12 because when we study them, we get to know God better. I was getting dressed to, to head down here today, and, and my, my, Danica, my oldest who's sick, um, said, Daddy, what are you going to preach tonight? And the question kind of caught me by surprise. I'm glad I knew my sermon so I could answer her question. And uh, I said, well, Daddy's going to talk about the Bible and why, we, and why we need to read the Bible. And she says, well, why do we need to read the Bible? And I said, because it helps us know God. And she was sitting on, on, my, on my bed watching TV. And she said, well, I already know God. <laughs> and just dismissed the whole idea of Bible study. Like, I don't need that. I, I know God already. Now, I could blow that off and say that that's just five-year-old nonsense and chatter, but there are a lot of grown Christians who feel like, I don't need my Bible, I know God already. So she, I actually saw that she was saying something more profound than even she understood. Knowing God is knowing his word and vice versa. Knowing his word is to know God. I've said to you before that in Psalm 40 and verse 7 and Hebrews 10 and 7, the Bible says, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. You don't know God apart from, apart from his word. Now, in theology, we make the distinction between natural revelation and special revelation. You can know that God exists from the created order, but you can't know him as his person apart from the word of God. That's the reason why atheists are liars. No one doesn't know that there isn't a God because you look at the created created order and you look at the specificity that God has worked into the created order and you cannot get that through natural means so everyone looks at the galaxy looks at the universe looks at the earth and looks at our solar system and says there there has to be a God there's no way through science to explain this naturally it's just it's a logical impossibility now they're still working on it and they'll be working on it until the end of time but you just can't get this from from absolutely nothing apart from a sovereign God so 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 the point here is to know God is to know his word 
and to know his word is to know God. Now, um, let's look at action number three in verse 13. He says, with my lips I proclaim all of your judgments. He says, I will proclaim them from my lips, the judgments that come from your mouth. Now, we talk about people who talk about the Bible all the time. We say that, uh, that they're holy rollers or that they're Bible thumpers. We don't want to hear that, right? Um, but, but the psalmist says that one of the actions that people that are living pure lives talk about God's judgments. Now, how might you talk about them without being a holy roller? Say you get a phone call and somebody calls you for advice. There's an opportunity for you to share the word of God without necessarily saying, well, the Bible says. So let's say you get a phone call from a friend of yours and they're asking for advice. And they say this to you. Um, well, look, now this is a male friend calling and he says to you, I got bad news. I, there's this girl that I was seeing, and, and uh, we, we had sex, and uh, she just called me and said that she's pregnant. Um, now her family is putting pressure on me to, uh, to marry her so that the baby is legitimate. I don't know what to do. I mean, I hardly know the girl. I think Usher wrote a song about that, didn't he? Yes, he did. Thank you, Alan. What do I do? Now, you might not be able to say, well, the Bible says, because they're obviously not interested in what the Bible is saying, as you can tell by their actions. But you might, you might be able to say, well, is it healthy? Is it wise to marry somebody for the sake of a child? You've got enough on your plate just getting ready for this baby and parenting. Is it wise to compile the matter with trying to work out the issue of trying to be married to somebody you hardly know? You had no intentions of marrying. Now, if you're talking to somebody who's a Christian who respects the scriptures, you might, give the, you might give this advice. You might say, well, the Bible says in Proverbs 18.22 that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. The psalmist, the, the, the sage, the, 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 the wise man didn't say when a man finds a woman who he, who's pregnant, who he's easy and pregnated, that she, he should make her his wife. We get married because we love someone and because God has sanctioned that relationship. We don't get married because a baby's on the way. Because guess what happens when, when you get married and you don't genuinely love the person and then you end up getting divorced. Now you've got two sins on your hand. You're already, you've already sinned by bringing a child into this world with a woman that you're not married to. You compile the matter by getting married when, you're not, when you don't hardly love the person. Now you, got, now, you got, now you got double retribution. Why do that to yourself? Now, if later on you fall in love with that person and, and, and you believe that you're soulmates, even after you've gotten through the difficulty of trying to figure out what you do, then that makes sense. But why do we put that on people? That, there's no principle in the Bible that says that because you've married, because you've gotten somebody pregnant, that you should, you're obligated to marry that person. That's nonsense. Most of the people who do that, their relationship falls apart. Now, they stick together to raise the kid, but the marriage usually fails. We don't get, the, we don't get married for those reasons. So I can speak, I can proclaim God's judgments just by giving advice when God, when the opportunity presents itself and we get those phone calls. We need to know God's word well enough to be able to apply it in some situations where, where there are some things that, that where, where there are some principles that, that, are, that seem to be in conflict. We need to know God's word because you can always find a verse of scripture that will contradict another one. And so we want to be careful about that and we want to, we want to talk about that um, in, in the, in, you know, as we 
talk to people about about that sort of stuff. Um, I was talking to uh, the priest, our treasurer. One of the pastors uh, that was on KKLA had a moral failure, um, and he stepped away from pastoring and and um, left his church. But now he's been um, he's been restored to the pastoral ministry. Pastor Joe trained me. Once you mess up, you don't get another shot. So that's why I'm trying to be pure, because I know once I, I mess up, I don't get another shot, at least not while he's around. But, this, but there are some people in Christendom that believe that, that a pastor can have a, a, a major moral indiscretion and be restored. I don't believe that. Now, they cite all of the issues of God you know, restoring David. Um, the whole idea of Christianity and faith is about grace. And so you know, to say that a pastor can't be restored... The ministry is legalistic. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's not being gracious. It's all of these things, and and they can throw a, the whole Bible at you on that. My my point is that I would make, and we were dialoguing about this. My point is is that the Bible says in First Timothy chapter three that that a bishop, a pastor, an elder, an overseer must be above reproach. And when Paul was telling Timothy about being above reproach, Paul was saying you can't have any handles. You can't have anything going on in your life that somebody can, can attach, can hold on to you and say that you've, done, that you've done something that disqualifies you for ministry. I would say a moral indiscretion gives you a handle, and that disqualifies you for ministry. But what about the whole Bible of grace and God restoring people? Yeah, all of those instances are true, but you can't find any pastor who falls in the scripture and God restores him. Hmm. You can't show me that. That's why Paul told Timothy to clean it up at Ephesus. You got issues there because you got people in leadership that shouldn't be. So I would say that God forgives sins. We serve a God of another chance. I've said that 32,000 times from this pulpit. So I believe in God's, the, the, God's restoration. But you don't find any pastor, any bishop that has a major moral indiscretion and God restores him to the pasture. So I would argue that God's principle of grace, when it collides with what Paul says in 1 first, in first Timothy 3, one of those has to trump the other. And I would say that all of those other instances are not pastors. So Paul's principle in 1 Timothy 3 must trump the others because Paul is dealing with pastors. Not with kings or prophets or deacons or anything. he's dealing with pastors. So uh, the priest and I were saying, I don't think that I don't believe in restoration, because if they can be restored, then who cares whether they're above reproach? Paul wasted ink on that on that the papyri that he wrote. If you could be restored, then uh, being above reproach is 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 just is just fluff. So we've got to understand the word of God well enough to when, to when principles uh, seem to be in contradiction, which one trumps the other? When Rahab hid the spies and lied to the men, she, she chose saving life over telling the truth. My wife wore her hair, um, wore her hair in a way yesterday that uh, was my favorite way she wore her hair. And I told her it was my birthday yesterday. So I said to her, oh, did you wear your hair like that for me on my birthday? She said, no. I said, you know, you can lie sometimes. Sometimes it's okay to lie. She says, no, I'm not a liar. I hate lying. I said, Rahab lied because it was for the greater good. You could have been nice to me on my birthday and said, oh, baby, it was just for you. But her, she, she took the lesser principle. You know how we are. So, I will proclaim all of your judgments. Boy, we need to talk more about God's word. May it come from his mouth to our lips. Verse uh, 14, uh, the, we see attitude number two. He says, I will rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as all riches. He says, that God's word is more important to me than winning that $300 million lottery uh, last week. And you know, we was all buying lottery tickets. You guys know you bought tickets. <laughs> I 
Yeah, because Pastor Joe rails against the lottery. But you know what I told him? I said, the first time one of us wins and we're going to buy Axe a whole corner, he's going to be the first one to take it. Oh, yeah, this is, the, this is the corner I want. Yeah, build us the church on that corner. He's been telling us for 13 years, stop buying lottery tickets. And as soon as you say you're going to build him a church, he's going to he's gonna go pick the ground. Don't pay him any attention. <laughs> <laughs> but is God's word more valuable to you than all the riches in the world? Do we treasure it? Is it, is it more precious than that? Well, in the, if you're con concerned with and focused on living a life of purity, God's word will, will be the utmost uh, priority to you. And I've already talked about what we would do if, if, we, if we did advice. Let's look uh, over at verse 15. Verse 15, you see, action number four he says I will meditate on your precepts and then action number five he says I will think about your ways he says I'll meditate on your precepts and I will think about God's ways so not only reading scripture but contemplating and reflecting deeply on what we've read sometimes we think we've done God's service when we have our little Bible study, and we read our few little verses, and then we're off doing the next thing. But we haven't really allowed that, that word to really just take root downward in order that God might disturb our tranquility or say something profound or challenge us in the area. Meditation and thinking deeply about God's precepts, his judgments, his decrees, his word is, is, a, is a part of that. That takes time. I remember I was taking my first uh, spiritual formation class, and those of you who know me, this was just not one of my favorite courses at seminary. And this class was all about just being still before God, practicing the spiritual disciplines. For 30 minutes, an hour, you couldn't do anything but sit there with your Bible and pray. Oftentimes I found my, my, myself dozing off, napping. But I'm doing homework. Or you're supposed to be there with your Bible and contemplating and reflecting. The next thing I know, I'm snoring. <laughs> but I had to try to train myself because I, I read and then I'm on to the next thing. And we're like that. We pick up our smartphone and we read our little passage. And next thing you know, we're, we're texting someone or checking an email or, or doing something on our calendar. And what we just read just doesn't do anything. We don't even, you know, a half the day later, we don't even remember we read it. So meditation, is the, it takes time, it takes concerted effort to do that. If we're going to live pure lives, if we're going to live lives that glorify God, godly lives, meditating and thinking deeply about God's word is absolutely essential. That takes time. That means you've got to say from 9.30 to 10, I've got to work that into my schedule. I'm not doing anything for that 30 minutes. Because you'll get a phone call, you'll get an email, something will come up that will crowd out that time. That didn't happen to the psalmist. He said, no, I spend time meditating and thinking deeply about God's word. That's verse, verse 15. Then in verse 16, he gives us one attitude and one action. Look at action, attitude number three in verse 16. He says, I will delight in your statutes. That means when it's, the word of God is a delight. He said earlier, I will rejoice in your precepts. The word of God should be something that, that delights us. It should be something that causes us to rejoice. It should produce happiness. You mean I get an opportunity to hear the voice of God again and again and again. You're not listening to some man speak. You're trying to discern from his voice what is the voice of God. And so we should delight in God's precepts and in his decree. That should, there, there should be no greater joy than the word of God. The people that rejoice in the word of God are the people whose lives are indicative of that joy. And so he says, I, that's an attitude you got to have. So you got to think to yourself, wow, I'm not sure I, I really delight when it's, when it's time to open up the scriptures. I, I mean, I think it's cool and I, and I like I like hearing someone preach or speak but I'm not sure it produces delight pray about that God wants his word to produce uh, an attitude of, of happiness and joy and, and delight that's awesome and then the last action is he says I will not forget your word 
we forget a lot of stuff. And especially as we get old, uh, we lose a lot of things that we used to remember. Um, but, but it takes work to remember the word. Like, I, like right now I'm taking a, a, spiritual form, uh, a spiritual formation class in the Pauline epistles. And I'm to so, so ticked off by this is that my teacher is requiring us to, to learn Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 17 by memory. And we got to recite it to a colleague in class. So I memorized Romans 8, 1 through 17. And it's not fun. But I don't think I'll ever forget Romans 8, 1 through 17. The psalmist says that one of, you, one of our actions has got to be that we don't forget the word of God. Committing it to memory. Remember we talked in verse 11 about hoarding it up? in our hearts in order that we might not sin, that's so we don't forget. Because the enemy wants to isolate us in a tricky situation where our Bible is not around, our smartphone is not handy, and then we make the wrong decision or we give the wrong advice. But if it's in your, if it's in your heart, you don't need your Bible or your smartphone. So we're too dependent upon our devices. I don't bring my Bible to church anymore. I just use my iPad or my iPhone. The only time I bring it is when I preach. But if you know what it says, you don't need any of that. Remember when we talked about Jesus being in, in, in the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil? Jesus didn't have a Bible. But he had the word of God. Well, he, he is the living word, so you would think he'd know it. But for us, he had treasured the word of God in his heart in such a profound way that he didn't need the, whole, the scriptures, the scrolls. He could, he could confront the enemy just with what he understood in Scripture. So, what we, so that's, what, that's what he's saying. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And that's what, God, that's what God wants for us. Now, I know what the objection is. The objection is this. You're thinking, wait a second. I know a lot of people who are pastors and spiritual leaders who have blown it. I know a lot of people. This doesn't really work, does it? I know that's your objection, right? Think about televangelists. People that have had these moral indiscretions. They're the teachers of God's word. This stuff really doesn't work, right? That's got to be your, somebody's thinking, I don't know about, I'm not sure I buy that. I would argue that their failure doesn't make this passage not true. We don't judge ourselves by ourselves or compare ourselves among ourselves. We are to obey God's word in spite of the negative examples that we see to the contrary. Because God's word will not fail. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away before God's word changes one period or one comma. So don't look at the, the culture and see people who screw up and they're Christians and you say but if they did it then surely this this doesn't work you apply it to your life the way God has prescribed it in scripture and trust God to hold you accountable and to keep you faithful to what God has challenged you to now how do we how do we do this how do we do this quorum Deo how do we live this out in the presence of God or before God's faith there we talk uh, every week about about three ways in which we can apply this we talk about our head, our heart, and our hands. God wants us to think differently about, about what he's challenged us to. He wants us to reflect and contemplate on what he said, and then he wants us to do some things that, that will change our current course if, if our current course needs changing. So with regard to our head, how does God want us to think? Here's one thing we got to think about this as a result of this message. Purity is a prerequisite to seeing God. And the Bible is the means to help, to help us live a life that's clean, that's pure, that's chaste, and that's godly. One thing we got to be certain of after this message is that God expects purity. He says, be holy as I am holy. Anyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Purity is a prerequisite, and it ought to be a priority. And the Bible is the medium that God wants to use to lead us in that process. That's what our thinking should be. And then 
with regard to our heart. How am I doing? What, how am I struggling with a particular sin? Am I reading my Bible? Am I, am I observing God's character as I read? Do I need to talk to someone about, about a struggle that I'm having? How does that look in your life, in your heart? When you lay down tonight, contemplate, reflect, Lord, I heard what, what the psalmist said today in Psalm 119, but I'm struggling. I don't, I don't know if my life could be characterized as pure. And I, I, and I recognize that you want this for me, but, but I'm having some issues. And so, Lord, I need you to, I need you to work, me, work me through those issues. And God will. But you've got to identify what, what the issues are. And that's, and that's between you and God. The, 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 and then with our hands, what do we need to do? God works through our head, our hearts, and our hands. What do we need to do in order to change our course if we're struggling with some sin if there is 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 an issue that we have in our life the first thing we need to do is ask God to forgive us the Bible says that in first John 1 and chapter 1 and verse 9 John says that if we confess our sins to God that he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so you need to talk to God about it he's your father he knows already there are no secrets with him and so the first thing you want to do is just be real with God and open up your heart to him and ask him to, to forgive you for what you've done. The other thing is, is I'm available. Call me. Uh, let's talk about it. Let, let, me, let me be a, 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 a resource to help you work through that and help pr and pray you through that and, and hold you accountable and, and ask you the tough questions and, and be your friend uh, to, to help you get through. That, that God, wants to, God wants to take us through the valleys um, of these difficulties in our lives, these moral and ethical uh, problems that we have. God wants holiness from us, and sometimes we need somebody to come alongside and help us through that. And then what happens is when God takes us through it, then we get the opportunity to be a liaison or a coach or a mentor to somebody else who's struggling. The third thing I would, I would offer you is that you should start reading your Bible. That's that's, that's, that's a great place to start because remember, when we read the scriptures, we're really getting to know God better. And so those are three things that I'd like to see you do. If you've got some, some real issues that, that, um, that, that, we, that I can't help you with, then uh, Pastor Joe is a licensed um, uh, marriage and family therapist, and we can get you some help there if we need to do that. Pastoral counseling is not enough. We can, we can get you some help uh, therapy-wise to help, help you work through the issues. But it's not okay for you to waddle in your sin. It's not okay for you to say, well, woe is me, or just to think that you can't get, o get over it or that God doesn't want to see you live a better life, a godly life, a life that's committed to purity. We, God wants you to get out of the situation you're in and be an example to, to what godly living looks like and a crooked and perverse generation. So that's my challenge. That's my exhortation. Why don't we pray to that end and ask God to work that in our spirit, shall we? Lord, the psalmist says tonight, how can a young man keep his way pure? And that is by keeping your word. And then we saw all of these attitudes and actions that, that are necessary for us to really live the life that you, Lord, you want our lives to be light to people who don't know you. Not just our lips and our rhetoric, but Lord, you want, you want our lives to be so appealing to people who don't know you that they come and, and they say, there's something special about you. I don't know exactly what it is, but I recognize you're not like everyone else. Lord, may we live in such a way. May our conversation, may our lifestyle, may our love Say that there's something different about us. May you live your life through us. May our neighbors, our roommates, our colleagues, our coworkers, our family members, our friends, may they see you in us and through us and all around us. Without purity, no one will see God. So Jesus, challenge us to make your word a priority so that you might wash us whiter than snow as we get the word of God into us. May you work purity 
in us and through us. That's our hope and that is our prayer tonight. So as we leave this place, may you have your way in our lives. That's, that's our hope and our prayer. We love you and we want to be more like you. In Jesus' name and for your sake we pray. Everyone said together, amen, amen. Woo! <laughs>